Hey guys, Dr. Ken Norberg again. <laughs> I don't know how I keep coming up with all these things, but you know, I've been putting on Whitetail seminars all over the country uh, in person since the 1980s. But in the last several years now, on the internet only, I still put on seminars occasionally for uh, sport club, you know, uh, clubs, uh, hunting and fishing clubs and that kind of thing, uh, uh, retailers in the local area here. But and years ago, I used to travel from Freeport, Maine and L.L. Bean down to Buckram and Atlanta and everywhere between there and here at home in Minneapolis. I couldn't do that anymore, <laughs> but, but I still like to teach. So today, I'm going to talk to you about an interesting subject. Uh, you know, you know, I've talked to you about all the books my three boys and I have taken since 1990, 101 of them, and the fact that about 80 percent of them were taken during the first two hours of the day, our legal shooting hour, which begins a half hour before sunrise. First light is another name for it. Uh, there's that other first light, like the glow on the horizon in the east in the early morning when uh, that usually is there when I get to my stand site, but that's 30 minutes or an hour before sunrise. But I'll begin, we always go to camp at noon. I, we, I always leave my stand site about 11, sometimes 10.30, and uh, to walk on one, my cruise trail in my square mile where I'm hunting that day to find four more fresh trucks and droppings by, by my tour bus. And we go to camp and have lunch and we talk to one another about our experiences of the morning and, and uh, opening morning there's always a big buck to bring in. I mean, need to get everybody to get together and go out and bring the duck buck in and, and get it hung up behind camp. And uh, that's always exciting. <laughs> and sometimes two, but, yeah, but usually the second day there's another one, sometimes two. So uh, those are exciting days. But anyway, we talk about things all right, and then we head back out to the woods again. But because of the way we hunt, we're going to and from stand sites in the dark every day. You know, going out early in the morning, it's pitch dark out there. And it's not unusual for many of us to have to travel as far as two miles to get to one special stand site in the dark in the morning. And we hunt in a deep wilderness area. There are not roads or any, hardly anything out there except deer trails. And uh, so, and then we have to walk in a special way. You know, walk nonstop at a moderate pace. Well, how do you do that in the dark and go two miles in the woods without goofing up, getting lost somewhere, or being forced to stop a lot, which is not good. Then all of a sudden those deer will think, that's a hunter, look at him, he stops and he's looking around, stopped. You don't fool those older deer into thinking you're a feeding deer when you do that. But anyway, so water pays in darkness. Uh, whether you're going to stand in the morning or leaving your stand in the evening, we don't leave the stand until a half hour after sunset in the evening, that's legal shooting time. And so it's dark, you know, five o'clock, it's dark. <laughs> so from that time on, you're in the dark and you're a long way from back. In fact, a lot of times it might be an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two if it's snowing, before you get back to camp in the evening. It might be eight o'clock before you get finally step into the tent back in camp. So a lot of to travel in darkness. And one of the things that we can't do without, you know, when you think of all the bucks we've taken, one of the products you can buy in the store is really important to us. I can't emphasize how important that is. And what is that product? It's one of these. <laughs> you know, that is a fluorescent tack. This one is two-sided. I, li I like that kind of a tack because you put it on one side of the tree, here's your trail, and it's on one side of the tree. Uh, you only need one tack coming and going. You know, when you're going, you see this side, and when you're coming back, you see the other side. So instead of having two tacks, 
one on this side and one on this side of the train. This one a, works for both. It makes, makes marking a trail a little quicker and a little bit less expensive, although these are more expensive than the single tax. Uh, but I like them. I like them a lot. So, and it's gray, kind of a light gray color. And uh, I like that town. Uh, stuck in the bark of a tree uh, during the time yet. Even though I know I got tax on this trail, you have to look carefully just to see the darn things. You know, wonder where the next tack is. Oh, it's right there. <laughs> that kind of thing. So we don't depend on these to get in and out of the woods during the day, midday. Uh, but more early morning, even, uh, these tacks, you shine a light. You don't have to shine a light right at them. If it, you can, when we're walking through the woods, our, the beam of our flashlight is pointed down toward the trail that we're coming. But just uh, the extra light that comes from around that beam will light up two, three of these tracks ahead of us when you're walking on the trail. And for that reason, we can walk, we can walk as far as two miles straight to the stand site without stopping, following this string of these little things and a, and a flashlight that makes them shine like little Christmas tree bulbs turned on. They're really bright little things in the light. Uh, that enables us to walk properly all the way to the stand. And we're almost. <laughs> We'll talk about that now. But anyway, we could not be the buckers we are without bees. That is an important, uh, one of the most important things we use for buck hunting. That and our folding tools that we carry on our backs, pack, you know, with shoulder straps on. That and, uh, and these. That's so important. And the head net, that's another one. That's, that's a product every hunter should do. I won't tell you the brand name. There, there's these things all over the country. Uh, I've used different colored ones. I found that the gray is more visible in the dark than some of the colored ones. So I stick with the gray personally. But look for that. And if you can't find the double-sided ones, the singles are okay. You put one on both sides of the tree. But you can stick these into little branches as big around as you're as your finger, you know? Doesn't hurt the tree, it's going to ruin somebody's chainsaw logging years later. But anyway, uh, and just a little pinprick in that into the rough bark, doesn't even get to the wood. Uh, that's all you need on there. And that'll last, that can last there for five, six, ten years. And uh, I found something that I put in 15 years ago. <laughs> They're still there, still marking the trail. So if you're not using the trail anymore, sometime when you're upscouting, you can might pull them out and use them on different, different trails. Because they're always changing portions or locations of portions of our cruise trails and stand side truck uh, trails. So you don't want these getting you all confused. You come in the woods and gee, you look, oh, there's my trail. I see two or three of these lit up. And you, oh crap, here's some going this way. No, I know I'm not supposed to go. But those are from years ago. So you don't want to get mixed up. Save a little money by pulling them out and using them again. So that is an important buck hunting tool. How about that? Now, let's look at the map here. All these trails in black, those black spot trails, in this square mile, have those tacks in it. Every single one. So you can walk out here in pitch dark and get your flashlight out and go <laughs> and be here. Like say at this stand site here, that's two miles to there. A uh, half hour before first light. You know, just a little glow on the eastern horizon when you get there. But let's talk about that. You know, making those things glow, you got to have a flashlight of some kind. I've used all kinds. I've had tap lights and, oh, years ago, I used to carry these big six volt battery type ones, you know, the great big lens on about that big around. I've got a couple of battery uh, flashlights spent some good money on, like uh, about 30 bucks, with a, with a light that's supposed to be able to see things a half mile away in the woods, you know. It occurred to me one day, I don't want to be able to see that far in the woods in the dark, because if I'm here 
and I can see something over there half a mile away with my flashlight. All of the deer between me and there are going to see my flashlight. And you don't have to tell a buck three and a half years or age or older what makes that. It's not, it's not a firefly. <laughs> firefly is kind of glowing green color. It's not a firefly coming. That's a human coming. And you can watch that light, you know, blinking on now and then, going through the window. There's a wink of light. And it, oh, it's going over there. Now it doesn't move anymore. It went over there. That's not good. So when you're using a flashlight, following a trail like that, your beam should be low. You know, you're standing up and beam down by your side. And it's pointed at your trails. Keep an eye on where you're walking. You don't have to have that light up here shining on those tacks in the trees I had uh, to see the tacks. That peripheral light is going to make them glow. Oh, 30, 40 feet away. So, the other thing, well, when you're using a, a light, I've learned using lots of different lights uh, over the years, uh, like a cap light, they have a little disc type battery that goes in them. And some of those would last up to, a, you know, a hunting season. But a lot of times I had to have extra ones along to put in the cap light uh, to make it last an entire hunting season. Some of those uh, really expensive ones will have four 3A batteries in them. They're the lowest ones you can buy, you know. And there'll be a little bank around in a central area put them all in there and you push that in there. I've learned that a single, a single LED light that's operating on two AA, AA batteries, those batteries will last more than twice as long, more than twice as long as, a, as one of those flashlights with three, with 3A batteries. These are 2A, the bigger ones. They last twice as long. And you know what's really crazy too about that? This is this is my favorite flashlight for going to a stand site in the dark or coming back from one in the dark. It costs less, less than three dollars. My son John has one that costs less than a dollar. The LED bomb with double A's. That'll last me an entire hunting season going in out twice a day. Every day okay? for for the 30 or two weeks that we're up there in the woods hunting whitetails, cheap. Uh, maybe some of those guys with the real expensive batteries in like what I'm saying, but if they convert those darn things to two double A instead of four, three, uh, they would be a lot more useful to hunters using them in the woods. And besides that, you don't like to see that way out there anyway when you're walking. I say. You keep your light pointed down. That means when you when you put a tack in a tree, it shouldn't be way up in the air. You know, your uh, shouldn't be head high when you're walking through. So you have to be holding your light beam higher in the tree. Uh, for years, I used to put them down about. I, I've been putting my tacks as low as 18 inches to up to 24 inches above the ground in the trunk of a tree. Or it's a sapling, even, you know, down the hall. And I got crossed up by Mother Nature a few times. Get a snow, a couple, of few years ago we had hip deep snow on opening day. And uh, whole, all kinds of my tacks were under the snow. You walk in, couldn't see where the heck they were. You had to know where you were going. And hazel bush and everything were hanging down, being pinned down by the snow across trailing. Didn't even look like a trail. You knew it was over that way, you know. I'm by these big trees here, or those evergreens, or that birch clump, or whatever. I know it's there, but you couldn't even see the trail. And none of my little tacks. Kind of frustrating when that happens. So now, I put them between three and four feet above the ground. I can't imagine having that much snow before the season in November, more than three feet. So four feet is pretty good. But uh, keep your beam down, you know, you'll see them just fine at that level. Anyway, and then uh, just keep the beam down, like I say. Now, every once in a while I'll get a letter from somebody who will say, Oh, that's terrible, you going out there in the woods early like that. 
Uh, and trying to go without stopping. Well, the reason we can walk nonstop, acting as if we're not hunting, as if we're a wolf that just wants to be over there two miles away. And I'm not, not used to it all in there. I'm just walking steady in a moderate pace. Uh, anything hunting doesn't walk that way. Uh, Neil, whether it's a bear or a, or a wolf or a human, it's not hunting. It's heading to some place way over there somewhere. But you're sure not acting like we're looking for a deer. So, but anyway, you can do that when you got the tacks in the trees and a flashlight. Now, the thing is, you don't want the deer to see that flashlight coming. Well, let her, yeah, they say, oh, you're going to ruin it. You're going to chase the deer away from your stand site. They'll see the flashlight coming. They'll hear you coming. Uh, terrible way. How do you ever see a deer at a tree stand when you go there? I would never do that. And I, I've written several times, I'm commonly field nesting a deer while hunters on a gravel road south that can hear them going like heck speeding to areas where they're going to hunt. I, I've shot it during the first 15 minutes of, of the first illegal shooting hour of the day. I'm field dressing a big buck when they're just getting there. And we, we've taken 101 bucks in, since 1990 doing what we're doing, and we would never have been able to even come close to that kind of record if we were just getting to our stand site at that time of day. We want to be there half hour before first light in the morning. For the really simple reason that someone will hear you, but if they can't tell what you are, if you're not acting as if you're hunting, if you're moving steadily at a modern pace, not stopping all the way, they're just going to move aside and stand in cover, watch you go by, or if you're there around you stand, they might move in the cover, and they'll wait for a while. Gee, all of a sudden it's silent over there. What happened? Did he, did he go away and we didn't hear him? It, it didn't sound like a human. Uh, maybe it was just a squirrel or a fox or a fisher or something. And so they'll wait around for a while and uh, for up to 30 minutes. And finally after that amount of time, uh, almost always, then they start moving again. They didn't run away, they're there. And then all of a sudden you start seeing them. Minutes after legal church shooting, we want to be there at that time. But we're going to get that half hour out of the way. So getting there with a the flashlight is really important. But I know when you get close to your stand site, like we expected to see deer feeding right over there, first light. Right over there, 30 yards away, 20 yards away even. Yeah, there, real close. Well, um, that's what you expect. Well, you can't be going in there all the way with a flashlight beam shining because it'll be flashing through the trees. Well, I, I've got stands that I've used over the years that where you were hidden by a, a high little ridge all the way to within the last 20, 30 yards of your stand site. So you can use the flashlight all you want. They'd never see it. And it would hardly be able to even hear you even better because you've got this berm between you and where they are as you're getting there. But during that last 20, 30 yards, that's kind of a critical time. And so we've learned, you know. Uh, when I, you know, when I, I've got certain signs I use along a trail. Let me show you something. Uh, when I put one tack in a tree, let me see what, there's, you see a tack, well actually several. That means keep going straight ahead. If I have to make a turn somewhere, I'll put in two. And there's, usually I remember, oh I gotta go to the right when I run into this one. There's two tacks. Maybe on both sides of the tree or on the tree, like here and here. But there's two. And if you're not sure and you get there, well, usually, like, if I got a split in the trail, I'll throw a dead, a, a dead log or a branch or tree on the trail I don't want to go on. Natural kind of thing. Well, I don't go that way. This one is open. I'm going to go this way. Or just turn your light around. Oh, there's my next stack showing me which way to go. No question about that. That's no problem. But when I get to that critical spot, you know, you're out there selecting stand sites, and you just think that, God, I 
can't go any closer to this without those deer being sure to see that flashlight beam. I come to three of them on a triangle on a tree, like right that. And that means stop. Uh, at this point, I stop. Turn off my flashlight. It goes in my side pocket, my hunting coat. Or you know, a lot of times when, I, when I'm hiking like this, I'll stuff my coat in my pack sack that's attached to my uh, stool and uh, to avoid perspiring on the way there. And this is a good place to help slip off my stool silently, put it down carefully. I'm still in a place that can't see the light. They can't see me moving either at this point. I'm still sick from that. And this is a good place to slip on my coat. Avoid the excessive movements when you get to your stand site okay, in the dark. Because they can see in the dark as well as you and I can see during daylight hours. Oh dear. So, so, now at this point, when I, I turn off my light and put on my coat, and if it's still too dark, let's say it's cloudy. Uh, if it's clear out there, starlight, you know, let your eyes get adjusted in the dark, and starlight alone can be enough to see the rest of the way. Here's my trail, you see it going over there? It's pretty obvious because it's clean for no dead branches laying. You cleaned it out two weeks earlier. It's very clean. So it's the start tip that way. So you start out and just keep walking steadily. You can do it at a slower pace then. But at this point, you're trying not to make any sounds with your footsteps. You want to be silent passage. You're going there. Uh, sometimes, if there's moonlight, even if there's clouds, with moonlight, gee, there's plenty of light after you let your eyes become adjusted when you stop here. Plenty of light now to find your way the rest of the way you're standing. Moonlight makes it easier. And up where I hunt, Every now and then we get bright northern lights as well. And boy, the northern lights can make it like a, you're in the carnival out there with all the bright light, different colors. March really easily right to your stand side. I've got some places like that where the last 10 yards I had to get down on my hands and knees <laughs> and crawl through the snow or the ground, crawl on this clean trail because only that high uh, cover thick enough to hide my silhouette when I'm getting to the last little bit to my stand. I've got several like that. You crawl and get up there behind your blind, natural blind, somewhere I made the blind with dead branches and trees laying in the area. Big boulder there next to it. And that's something that, where if you do that, it isn't a sore thumb. Man, big boulder is always there, or this big tree that's laying there has always been there for a long time. So any changes you make aren't really noticeable, but crawl up to that spot and put my stool down in there and get down, sit carefully on it, my head down, pull my my uh, camel head net down, it's usually on my head, <laughs> and a cap on top, and pull that down and put some gloves on my hands, no bright, no bright skin showing out. And then sit back with my back against a boulder or a tree and relax and wait for 30 minutes. Don't move. Or if you're going up in the tree stand, your tree stand's like in this clump of evergreens and there's what's this nice clean popple in the middle of it where you can climb without making a lot of noise and the bark, you know, like a bear mix when he's climbing a tree, no scratch, 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 none of that kind of stuff. Real silent and you're hidden by the evergreens all around it. And you get up there and, and get, hook up your harness and turn, sit down quietly, and get ready to make. You can even put a bullet into the chamber or your rifle at that point, silently. I've taught you how to do that, how to move your safety on and off silently. We've talked about that already. Okay. Now you're in business. Yep. And you're sitting here for your 30 minutes. All of that is made possible by your tack and your flashlight, your old flashlight. So, okay. How important that is to buck hunting? <laughs> okay. So, that's something to think about. You know, this tech business, 
source and tax business is so vital to good buck hunting. I, you know, without tax, we, my sons and I would never come close to taking near as many bucks as we've taken. That's so important. Okay? And good thing about tax too, you know. You're using natural deer trails to get to and from your stand site. And these things are not easy, you think they'd be easy, they're not easy to see during daylight hours on trees. Or break by them without noticing them. Which means you're not sharing <laughs> what you've learned and what you've set up with other hunters. Now, they see that trail just an ordinary deer trail. Maybe not even one that carried a wolf follow. No, I'm going to go this way or something. Uh, they look up, they look down that way, they don't see the tacks. That's good. These tacks never begin close to a road that other hunters can drive on or other hunters' popular way to walk on this forestry trail or something out into the woods. Never begin on that. Somebody going down there with a flashlight aren't going to see your markers. These markers start by that big evergreen over there. You know, here's one close to the road, this one here. This one got a broken top or something. Well, here I'm here. You look around it, you go toward that tree that's sticking up over the horizon over there. Stick out in the sky, that's that big tree. So you start off on that direction, and pretty soon you're getting close, and bingo, your first tack lights up. Now you're on your trail. We do that all the time. We never make it easy for other hunters to find our trails. They might find them because of our footprints in the snow. But they don't know, you get a new snow, and that's lost again. But anyway, that's how we use those tacks. When we're when we're heading to deer camp every year, and even when we go up scouting, we'll find uh, strips of fluorescent tape hung on bushes alongside the road. It's, the major road isn't much of a road; it's gravel. Uh, all along that that trail, miles and miles, and there's some more on there. That's a tip off to every hunter. <laughs> Whoever drives that road, there's a trail there. Somebody made. Sure enough, you go in there, oh, there's some more tape, and there's more, and it's permanent and easy to spot. So you're inviting other hunters who don't know what the heck they're doing or where to hunt or anything. Come and hunt here, this must be a good spot. This trail marker here says, this is a good place to go hunting. You might walk out there, opening my there's a guy sitting in your tree stand. Uh, we've had that happen. In my first study here in Aiken County, after years of creating permanent type tree stands, uh, elevated stands, which were legal back then, I had 22 of them out in the woods. And then, uh, the, the last year we hunted there, well, on opening morning, my uh, five children and I, and my father, and uh, uh, a, a brother-in-law, went went out that morning to hunt in our tree stands that we had selected and made. Everyone was filled by a stranger. Because, because during the previous winter they built a two-lane road, 50-mile-an-hour road, right through the middle of our hunting area. And people, oh, right, new place got in, people scouting all over in there, running all over with their ATVs. And they found every one of our stands. Because back in those days, we didn't have tacks. The only thing, we didn't use ribbons either. We made blazes on trees. We'd take a knife, a heavy knife or a light axe, and, and chop a piece of the bark off, bright marks on the tree trunks, and use them like we do our fluorescent tack. Boy, that was an invitation to others. Oh, look here's a trail. Oh, look there. Look at that nice stand. And according to law, I couldn't go out and say, hey, get out of my tree stand. I made that. Anybody could use it if you did that on public land. Get in a big fight about that. <laughs> I, we didn't want that. No. But after that year, that was a, almost a clincher. <laughs> Time to find a new place to hunt there. So we, next year, we found a place where we've been hunting now since 1990, almost 30 years. Well, so 
Tax. <laughs> now you're both tax. And how important they can be to your hunting success. And if you do it right, don't worry, you aren't going to screw up because of your flashlight beam, noises you make, or the way you walk, or, or getting to your stand, doing all that stuff. That's not going to throw it. In fact, you're going to do better even uh, than you would ever do. And if you go out there after first light, you can walk and walk and see your way to your stand. Once you do that, when you wait that way, you've lost about 80% of your best hunting. How about that? That's something. Sure, we get them in the evening, uh, sometime in the middle of the day. Uh, we've gotten them other strange places, like uh, one of my sons got one while sitting on the latrine in our camp area. Uh, so you never know. But most of the big bucks, all of the big bucks I ever taken, were taken doing these things and using those tacks. So there you go. Another great tip. Uh, there. Now guys, uh, if you like what you heard today, and you should, <laughs> I can't imagine why you wouldn't like to learn these things. Uh, if you should, uh, uh, please subscribe to my my YouTube uh, uh, account and uh, also if you like what you had, please give me a thumbs up. Uh, big favors for me. Uh, you know, uh, as you might guess, I put a lot of time into this and giving you good good tips, making a better hunters out of you, every one of you. And uh, I want to keep doing that. Uh, if there wasn't some kind of reward for all this, uh, I, I, at my age, I'd say, well, I won't do this so much anymore, man. Or maybe not at all. So, keep me wanting to do this, okay? Uh, subscribe and give me a thumbs up. Thanks a lot, guys. And uh, don't forget this video, this book. Once you once you've bought this one, my best book ever, my best deer hunting book ever, most comprehensive. Huge compared to anything else I've ever written. Uh, you're going to love this for the rest of the days you hunt here. Every year you're going to refer back to this until the day you die. And then you, all your sons is going to tell you, oh God, I got Dad's book. Uh, you, it's truly going to be that way. I know that because my nine other white hunter, hunters and my almanacs have been that way. People don't give these, they, they, they you don't find these in, in uh, uh, bookstores, used bookstores, they don't just get given away uh, free. In uh, fact, uh, my smaller books, 187 pages, pretty typical size, sell today on uh, eBay for as much as $250, and they're dirty and wrinkled and dog-eared and $250. Bucks. Uh, wonder how much you get for a used Bible, huh? Uh, then imagine what kind of this book's going to sell for someday. You know, I've had some of my books, especially the second edition, the one that uh, the first literature ever to accurately describe the whitetail rut. I was the first one to do that. Uh, and how to hunt bucks all through the five phases of the rut, from September 1st till the end of January or end of December. First book ever to do that. That one has sold for as much as a thousand dollars. So imagine <laughs> what this will be worth someday, long after I'm gone. So anyway, uh, get your book. Start boning up what, what you have to know uh, to be a great buck hunter this year. This is it. Best thing I can give. This is my number one tip ever. <laughs> so okay, thanks again, guys. I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries. And be sure to sign up for my email updates. Here you will also find deer and bear hunting articles, my website bookstore and much more.